Championship Fighting, Explosive Punching, and Aggressive Defense by Jack Dempsey. Jack Dempsey, who lived from 1895 to 1983, held the World Heavyweight Championship from 1919 to 1926. Many of his fights set financial and attendance records, including the first million dollar gate. Dempsey was inducted into the Boxing Hall of Fame and is considered to be one of the greatest boxers of the 20th century. Chapter 1. Explosives at Toledo. What would happen if a year-old baby fell from a fourth floor window onto the head of a burly truck driver standing on the sidewalk? It's practically certain that the truckman would be knocked unconscious. He might die of brain concussion or a broken neck. Even an innocent little baby can become a dangerous missile when its body weight is set into fast motion. You may feel as helpless as a year-old infant, as far as fighting is concerned, but please remember, one, you weigh more than a baby, and two, you need not fall from a window to put your body weight into motion. You have weight, and you have means of launching that weight into fast motion. Furthermore, you have explosive ingredients. You may not appear as harmless as a stick of dynamite, which children have been known to mistake for an oversized stick of taffy. You can launch your body weight into fast motion, and like dynamite, you can explode that hurtling weight against an opponent with a stunning, blasting effect known as follow-through. Incidentally, mention of the baby and explosives reminds me of what happened at Toledo. On the afternoon of July 4th, 1919, standing there that day under the blazing Ohio sun, I felt like a baby as I glanced across the ring and saw big Jess Willard shrug off his bathrobe in the opposite corner. Cowboy Jess was heavyweight champion of the world, and he was a giant. Moreover, he was a perfectly proportioned giant. He was every inch an athlete. He tapered down beautifully from derrick-like shoulders and his muscles were so smooth you could scarcely see them rippling under his suntan skin. He towered six feet six inches and a quarter. He weighed 245 pounds. In comparison, I shaped up like an infant or a dwarf, although I nudged past six feet and scaled 180 pounds. My weight was announced as 187 pounds, but I actually registered only 180. As I looked across the ring at Willard, I said to myself, Jeez, what a mountain. I've got a blast down this time. I knew about blasting, about dynamite. I had learned about dynamite in the mines of Colorado, Utah, and Nevada, where I had worked off and on for about six years. And I knew plenty about dynamite in fighting. I had made a study of fistic dynamite since I was seven years old. That was when I had my first fist fight with a boy about my own size in Manassa, Colorado. I was born at Manassa and spent my early years there. Before I fought Willard, my manager, Doc Kearns, already had a nickname, already had nicknamed me Jack the Giant Killer because I had belted out such big fellows as Carl Morris and Fred Fulton. They were big men, all right, but neither had appeared. Such an awesome giant as Willard did that sweltering afternoon. I had trained for Willard at the Overland Club on Maumee Bay, an inlet of Lake Erie. Nearly every day, Kearns and trainer Jimmy DeForest reported that I was shaping up much better than Willard. But when I saw Big Jess across the ring, without an ounce of fat on his huge frame, I wondered if Kearns and DeForest had been bringing me pleasant but false reports to bolster my courage. I won't say I was scared as I glazed at Willard, but I'll admit I began to wonder if I packed enough dynamite to blast the Man Mountain down. Since this is not a story of my life, I'll refrain from boring you with details of the fight. I'll wrap it up in a hurry. I'll merely recall that I sent Jess crashing to the canvas six or seven times in the first round and gave him such a battering in the third session that Jess was unable to come out for the fourth round. As Willard sat helplessly on his stool in the corner, his handlers threw in the towel just after the bell had rung to start the fourth. I won the World Heavyweight Championship on a technical knockout. 
I won the ring's most coveted title by stopping a man much larger and stronger than I was, who outweighed me by 65 pounds. I blasted him into helplessness by exploding my fast-moving body weight against him. I used body weight, with which the falling baby could knock out the truck driver, and I used explosion. Exploding body weight is the most important weapon in fist fighting, or in boxing. Never forget that. I was at my peak as a fighter that day, the day I met Jess Willard under the broiling Toledo sun. My body weight was moving like lightning, and I was exploding that weight terrifically against the giant. Even before the first round was finished, Willard looked like the victim of a premature mind blast. Chapter 2. Good and Bad Toledo Aftermaths The explosives I displayed against Willard were harnessed soon by promoter Tex Rickard to produce five gates of more than one million dollars each. Those receipts were genuinely remarkable, for when Willard and I drew $452,224 at Toledo, that was the largest fight gate on record. My five big money bouts were with George Carpenter of France, Luis Angel Firpo of Ar Argentina, Jack Sharkey of Boston, and Gene Tunney of New York. Two, because I was a good puncher and because each opponent in those five big gates was a hard hitter, the tremendous publicity given those extravaganzas made the world more punch conscious than ever before. Incidentally, don't let anyone tell you Gene Tony couldn't punch. Many fight fans have that wrong impression today. In our first bout at Philadelphia, where Gene wrested the title from me, he landed a right-hand counter to the head that staggered me early in the first round. I didn't recover fully from that punch during the rest of the fight. And at Chicago, in our second scrap, Gene drove me to one knee with a head blow in the eighth round, mind you. That was after I floored him for the long count in the seventh. Indeed, I found Gentleman Gene surprisingly explosive. Since those golden Rickard Dempsey days, the public's worship of punch has become more intense, for interest in the K.O. sock has been stimulated increasingly by press, radio, and television. And that intense public interest in punch has been one ad admirable aftermath of the blastings in Toledo. In addition, those big gates gave lads everywhere the desire to become good punchers so that they too might hammer out riches with their fists. Those two effects, public worship of punch and youngsters' desire to hit hard, would have had a most beneficial influence upon the science of self-defense were it not for an unexpected, blighting development. Unfortunately, my big gates did more to commercialize fighting than anything else in pugilistic history. They transformed boxing into a big-time business. As a commercial enterprise, the fight game began attracting people who knew little or nothing about self-defense. Hoping to make quick money, they flocked into boxing from other fields. They came as promoters, managers, trainers, and even instructors. Too often, they were able to crowd out old-timers because they had money to invest because they were better businessmen, or merely because they were glib-talking hustlers. They joined the gold rush in droves, dentists, doctors, lawyers, restaurant proprietors, clothing manufacturers, butchers, grocers, bookies, racket guys, and pool hall hangers-on. Fellows who never tossed a fist in their lives became trainers. They mistaught boys in gymnasiums. Those mistaught youths became would-be fighters for a while, and... When they hung up their gloves, they too became instructors. It was only natural that the tide of Palooka experts should sweep into the amateur ranks where lack of knowledge among instructors today is as pathetic as among professional handlers. And that's not the worst. Too many amateur instructors have forgotten entirely that the purpose of boxing lessons is to teach a fellow to defend himself with his fists not to point him toward amateur or professional competition with boxing gloves. To a menacing extent,
the major purpose of fistic instruction has been bypassed by amateur tutors who try to benefit themselves financially, indirectly or directly, by producing punchless performers who can win amateur or professional bouts on points. Not one youth in 50 has any ambitions to become a professional fighter when he first goes to an instructor. That's particularly true among college and high school lads, yet the instructors continue teaching boys to become smart boxers instead of well-rounded fighters. And that's a downright shame, for punch is absolutely essential in fist fighting, and it's an invaluable asset in amateur or professional boxing. Actually, it's stupid instead of smart instruction to teach other fighting movements to a boy before he has been taught to punch. Because of this commercial win-on-a-point-as-soon-as-possible attitude among modern instructors, the amateur and professional ranks today are cluttered with futile club fighters and fancy dans. In the professional game, there are so few genuine fighters that promoters find it almost impossible to make enough attractive matches to fill their boxing dates. At this writing, lack of worthwhile talent in the heavyweight division is particularly appalling. It's almost unbelievable that the heavy division should have declined so far since the days when I was fighting my way up in 1917, 1918, and 1919. The class was jammed with good men then. Jess Willard was champion. On his trail were Carl Morris, Frank Morin, Bill Brennan, Billy Misk, Fred Fulton, Homer Smith, Gunboat Smith, Jim Flynn, and Porky Flynn. There were Sam Langford, Harry Wills, Tommy Gibbons, and Willie Meehan. With the exception of Fat Meehan, any one of those top fighters could knock your brains out if you made a mistake while facing him. Meehan, although a slapper, threw so much leather and was so rugged that he and I broke even in our three four-round bouts. I won, we drew, and I lost. Lack of top-notchers in the heavy division and in all most other divisions today reflects the scarcity of good instructors and trainers everywhere. There are a few good ones lingering on, but they are notable exceptions. Joe Lewis found a good instructor when he was about 16. He found Alter Ellis at the Brewster Center in Detroit. Ellis, an old-time fighter, taught Joe how to punch and how to box. And when Joe turned professional, he went immediately under the wing of the late Jack Blackburn, grand old-time fighter and one of the finest trainers the ring ever produced. Joe developed into an accurate, explosive sharpshooter who could take you out with either fist. He was a great champion. Chapter 3. Punchers are made, not born. Lewis retired as undefeated heavyweight champion in 1949, and I'll bet that as he retired, Joe considered himself a natural-born puncher. I know that's probably true because I had the same mistaken idea about myself during my career, and for a long time after I hung up my gloves. If you're a punching champion, it's natural for you to get the wrong appreciation of yourself. Hundreds of admirers pat you on the back and tell you what a natural-born fighter you are. And when you're swept along toward seventh heaven by the roar of the crowd in your magnificent moments of triumph, it is easy to forget the painstaking labor with which you and your instructors and trainers and sparring partners fashioned each step in your stairway to the throne. It's easy to forget the disappointments and despair that at times made the uncompleted stairway seem like Heartbreak Hill. Ah, yes, when you're on the throne, it's easy to regard yourself as one who was born to the royalty of the ring. In your heyday as champion, you can't see the forest for the trees. As an historian might express it, you're too close to your career to get the proper perspective of highlights and background. It was only after I had retired and had begun trying to teach others how to fight that I investigated the steps in my stairway, analyzed my own technique, 
and that was a tough job. You see, by the time a fellow becomes a successful professional fighter, nearly all his moves are so instinctive through long practice that it is difficult for him to sort out the details of each move. Accordingly, it is nearly impossible at first for him to explain his moves to a beginner. He can say to the beginner, you throw a straight right like this. Then he can shoot a straight right at the punching bag. But the beginner will have no more conception of how to punch with the right than he had before. That's the chief reason why so few good fighters developed into good instructors. They failed to go back and examine each little link in each boxing move. They tried to give their pupils the chains without the links. When I began breaking down my moves for the purpose of instruction, I found it most helpful to swing my memory clear back to the days when I was a kid at Manassas, a small town in southern Colorado. I was fortunate as a kid. My older brothers Bernie and Johnny were professional fighters. They had begun teaching me self-defense by the time I was seven years old. In my breakdown, I tried to recall exact details of the first fundamentals my brothers taught me. I jotted down every detail of those instructions I could remember, and every detail that dawned on me while I was practicing those early fundamentals. Then I moved mentally across the Great Divide to Montrose, Colorado, the town where I spent my later youth. There was more interest in fighting in Montrose than in any place of its size I've ever known. It was a town of would-be fighters. In some Montrose families, there were four or five brothers who wanted to be fighters. I found plenty of kid sparmates there and plenty of instructors, some good, some bad. My investigation of technique took me on a long mental journey as I followed my fighting trail through the West where I had worked at any job I could get in mines, lumber camps, hash houses, on ranches, etc., I was fighting on the side in those days, and I was getting pointers on self-defense from all the old-timers I met. Each trainer, each manager, each fighter had his own ideas and his own specialties. Like a blotter on legs, I absorbed all that information in those days and then discarded what seemed wrong. Swinging back through memory lane, I found myself at 21, making my first trip to New York where I fought Andre Anderson, Wild Bert, Kenny and John Lester Johnson, who cracked two of my ribs. Although that New York trip was a disappointment, I received much valuable fighting information from top flight heavies like Frank Moran, Bill Brennan, Billy Misk, and Gunboat Smith, when each dropped into Grupp's Gymnasium. And I recalled the details of my later postgraduate courses in fighting from Doc Kearns and Trainer DeForest, one of the best instructors in the world. DeForest's career went clear back to the days of Peter Jackson and London Prize Ring Rules. That geographic investigation of my own technique really humbled me. It hit me right on the chin with the booming fact that since I was seven years old, I'd had the opportunity to learn punching from a long parade of guys who had studied it. I had absorbed their instructions, their pointers, their theories in Manassas, Montrose, Provo, Ogden, Salt Lake City, Goldfield, Tonopah, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, St. Paul, and many other cities before I met Willard at Toledo. And let me emphasize that in the days when I was drinking in all that information, the fighters, trainers, and managers knew much more about punching than they generally know today. You must remember that when I fought Willard in 1919, it was only 27 years after Jim Corbett had beat John L. Sullivan at New Orleans in the first championship fight with big gloves. While I was coming up, the technique of the old masters was still fresh in the minds of fighting men. Now, it is 30 years since the day I fought Willard. During those 30 years, fighting became big business. But in the scramble for money, in the cauliflower patch, the punching techniques of the old masters, Sullivan, Corbett, Bob Fitzsimmons, Tommy Ryan, Joe Gans, Terry McGovern, and others, seems to have been forgotten. 
Chapter 4 Why I Wrote This Book Naturally, I didn't make the detailed exploration of my fighting past all at one sitting. I'm a restless guy. I don't like to sit long in one place. But I became so interested in the work that sometimes I'd spend an hour or two hours at it. I did it on trains, in planes, in hotel rooms, and at home. Max Waxman, my business manager, used to say, For crying out loud, Jack, what are you writing down all that junk for? You're supposed to be a memory expert. You must have all that dope about fighting right in your own head. Seems silly to see you sweating and fuming and writing notes about stuff you got at your fingertips. Well, the log of my mental journey from Manassa to Toledo filled 384 pages with closely written notes in long hand. I'm confident those 384 pages represented the most thorough study ever made by any prominent fighter of his own technique and the pointers he had received firsthand from others. But my job had only begun. I spent several months studying that mass of information and separating it into the different departments of self-defense, under sections, subsections, sub-subsections, etc. I waded through it again and again. I combed it. I sieved it. I sluice-boxed it for details I needed in each smallest sub-subsection. And then, into each slot, I dropped any additional knowledge I had gained since Toledo. Those different departments, with their various minor brackets, gave me, for the first time, a clear panorama of self-defense. I was pretty proud of my panorama. I was confident, at last, that I could take the rawest beginner, or even an experienced fighter, and teach him exactly what self-defense was all about. Then, I became curious to compare my panorama with those of other men in boxing. I talked to many fighters, trainers, and instructors, and I read every book on boxing I could buy. My conversations and my reading left me utterly amazed at the hazy, incomplete, distorted conceptions of self-defense possessed by many who are supposed to be experts. Perhaps I was unjustly critical. Perhaps none of them had had my unusual opportunities to get a blueprint that mapped all the fundamentals, at least. Or perhaps they took many fundamentals for granted and did not include them in their explanations. At any rate, I came to the conclusion that self-defense is being taught wrong nearly everywhere for the following major reasons. 1. Beginners are not grounded in the four principal methods of putting the body weight into fast motion. A. Falling step. B. Leg spring. C. Shoulder whirl. D. Upward surge. 2. The extremely important power line in punching seems to have been forgotten. 3. The wholesale failure of instructors and trainers to appreciate the close cooperation necessary between the power line and weight motion results generally in impure punching, weak hitting. 4. Explosive, straight punching has become almost a lost art because instructors place so much emphasis on shoulder whirl that beginners are taught wrongfully to punch straight without stepping whenever possible. 5. Failure to teach the falling step, trigger step, for straight punching has resulted in the left jab being used generally as a light, auxiliary weapon for making openings and setting up instead of as a stunning blow. 6. Beginners are not shown the difference between shovel hooks and uppercuts. 7. Beginners are not warned that taking long steps with hooks may open up those hooks into swings. 8. The bob weave rarely is explained properly. 9. Necessity for the three-knuckle landing is never pointed out. 10. It is my personal belief that beginners should be taught all 
types of punches before being instructed in defensive moves, for nearly every defensive move should be accompanied by a simultaneous or a delayed counterpunch. You must know how to punch, and you must have punching confidence before you can learn aggressive defense. My dissatisfaction with current methods of teaching self-defense was the principal reason why I decided to put my panorama into a book. I realized, too, that my explosive performances and big gates in the golden decade were indirectly responsible for current unsatisfactory methods, so it was my duty to lend a helping hand. Moreover, it's my impression now that thousands of boys and men throughout the world would grasp eagerly at the chance to learn how to use their fists, how to become knockout punchers in a hurry. Never before has there been such a need for self-defense among fellows everywhere as there is today. Populations increased so rapidly during the past quarter century, while improved methods in transportation shrank the globe, that there is much crowding now. Also, the place of living has been so stepped up that there is much more tension in nearly every activity than there was in the old days. Crowding, pace, tension, cause friction, flare-ups, angry words and blows. That unprecedented friction can be noted, particularly in cities, where tempers are shortened by traffic jams, sidewalk bumpings, crowdings in subways and on buses, and jostlings in theaters, saloons, and nightclubs. Chapter 5. Differences Between Fistfighting and Boxing Anger provides the number one difference between a fistfight and a boxing bout. Anger is an unwelcome guest in any department of boxing. From the first time a chap draws on gloves as a beginner, he is taught to keep his temper, never to lose his head. When a boxer gives way to anger, he becomes a natural fighter who tosses science into the bucket. When that occurs in the amateur or professional ring, the lost head fighter leaves himself open and becomes an easy target for a sharpshooting opponent. Because an angry fighter usually is a helpless fighter in the ring, many prominent professionals, like Abe Attell and the late Kid McCoy, tried to taunt fiery opponents into losing their heads and opening up. Anger rarely flares in a boxing match. Different indeed is the mental conditioning governing a fist fight. In that brand of combat, anger invariably is the fuel propelling one or both contestants. And when an angry berserk chap is wailing away in a fistfight, he usually forgets all about the rules, if he ever knew any. That brings us to difference number two. The referee enforces the rules in a boxing match, but there are no officials in a fistfight. Since a fistfight has no supervision, it can develop into a roughhouse affair in which anything goes. There's no one to prevent low blows, butting, kicking, eye-gouging, biting, and strangling. When angry fighters fall into a clinch, there's no one to separate them. Wrestling often ensues. A fellow may be thrown to the earth, floor, or pavement. He can be hammered when he's down, or even be given the boots kicked in the face, unless some humane bystander interferes, and you can't count on bystanders. A third difference is this. A fistfight is not preceded by matchmaking. In boxing, matches are made according to weights and comparative abilities. For example, if you're an amateur or professional lightweight boxer, you will probably be paired off against a chap of approximately your poundage, one who weighs between 133 and 137 pounds, and you'll generally be matched with a fellow whose ability is rated about on par with your own to ensure an interesting bout and to prevent injury to either. If you boast only nine professional fights, there's little danger of your being tossed in with a top flighter or a champion. The eight weight divisions in boxing, heavyweight, light heavy, middle welter, light feather bantam and fly were made to prevent light men from being injured by heavy men. Weight is extremely important, you know. 
for moving body weight is punch. However, when a man is a heavyweight, more than 175 pounds, there's no top limit for him or his opponent. Remember, Willard 245, me 180? It's unfortunate that in fist fighting, destiny or luck makes the matches. Chance picks your opponent for a fist fight regardless of size, weight, age, strength, or experience. Nearly every chap has had the unhappy experience of being practically forced to fight someone larger than himself at some time in his life. A fourth difference is the distance or route. Modern boxing bouts are scheduled for a specified number of rounds, with a minute of rest between. In case neither contestant is knocked out or disqualified during the bout, the winner is determined by the number of rounds won or by the number of points scored. When a fist fight is started, however, it is informally slated to a finish. There is no let-up, no rest, until one scrapper is knocked out or beaten so badly he quits. You don't win a fist fight on points. Sometimes friends or the police halt a street scrap, but such interference cannot be counted upon. When a fellow squares off for a fist fight, he should be geared to finish it. He must make his own distance, his own route. Difference number five is footing. In the ring, boxers enjoy the best footing that technicians can devise. They glide about on the firm, level surface of ring canvas. Chances of slipping are, are reduced to a minimum by the use of soft leather boxing shoes. Powdered resin is sprinkled on the canvas, and then that resin is ground into the soles of the shoes. Naturally, there are no obstacles over which a boxer can trip or over which he can be knocked, except, of course, the ring ropes. The footing in fistfights is a gamble. Fights occur usually where they flare up, on playing fields, streets, roads, ship decks, or in stores, offices, factories, saloons, dance halls, etc. And a fellow performs in whatever shoes he happens to be wearing. He fights upon whatever surface chance has placed him, regardless of slipperiness, rocks, boxes, tin cans, or the like, and regardless of tables, benches, desks, chairs, or other large obstacles. If a chap slips, trips, or gets knocked over something, he may strike his head against an obstacle, or against the floor, sidewalk, or curb. Many deaths have resulted from falls in fist fights. Let me suggest that any time you are about to be drawn into a fist fight, keep your head and make a split-second survey of your surroundings. Decide immediately whether you have fighting room or whether you have good footing. If you haven't, Try to force your opponent to shift to another battleground, where your knowledge of fighting will leave the percentage in your favor. Yell at him, for example. Okay, wise guy, you want to fight? Let's see if you've got the guts to come out into the street and fight me like a man. In 99, out of 100 cases, you can force the other guy to move to an open spot by challenging his courage to do so. Don't let the action start in a crowded subway car in a theater aisle, in a restaurant, office, saloon, or the like. Keep your head and arrange the shift so that you'll be able to knock his head off when you get him where you can fight without footing handicaps. In concluding the differences, remember that your face can be cut much more quickly by bare fists than by one encased in bandages and padded gloves. From another angle, the boxer with fist protected by bandages and gloves has less chance than a barefisted man of breaking a hand, bone, or smashing a knuckle in case the fist lands squarely on the forehead or elbow. Those major differences add up to one important total or conclusion. The possibility of getting hurt is greater in a fist fight than in a boxing bout. Fist fighting is generally more dangerous than boxing. In connection with that danger, never forget the longer the fight lasts, the longer you are exposed to danger. Moreover, the danger percentage against you generally increases with each passing minute of the fight. 
When you square off, you hope to beat your opponent into submission in a hurry. But as the fistfight continues, you find you are not achieving your quick victory. You discover you are beginning to tire because of your exertions and because of your tensions. Since you have no chance for rest periods, the longer you fight, the more tired you become. True, your opponent also may be getting fatigued, but you can't be certain about his exact condition. Unless he's blowing and staggering, you know for sure only that you're nearly all in and that he's still out there swinging at you. Accordingly, the longer he keeps fighting, the less chance you have of winning. But the greater chance you have of being battered, cut up, knocked down, knocked out, or injured. Because of the danger in a fistfight, it is imperative that you end the brawl as quickly as possible. And the best way to do that is by a knockout. The knockout is far more important in fistfighting than in boxing. You've got to knock them out in fistfights.